So hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, what is really the first of our Identiverse webinars. This is actually something we've wanted to do for a very long time. Uh, and so I'm delighted uh, that now in conjunction with to start this, uh, what I hope will be a, a series of webinars on topics of general digital identity uh, interest. And we're going to start today with a conversation about authorization. Um, just before we get stuck in, uh, we'll do some introductions. So for those who don't know me, uh, I'm Andy Hindle. I'm the conference chair for Identiverse. Uh, I also consult uh, independently in digital identity and in privacy. Um, I have some background in authorization, which is uh, why I was particularly keen to do this one first. Um, I was involved with the uh, UMA working group. I've had some involvement with a couple of vendors in the space as well over time. Um, and what I suggest we do is run around uh, the panelists today, um, get quick introductions from them, uh, and then we'll get stuck into the conversation. And let's start with Jerry. All right. Thanks, Andy. Hi, I'm Jerry Gable, Head of Standards at Strata Identity. Uh, for a time, I used to work with one of our other panelists at Axiomatics and before that at Burton Group, where I met a bunch of you all and, and uh, also worked in industry at Chase Bank back in the day. Thanks, Jerry. Alan. Hi, everyone. I'm Alan Foster. And uh, let's see, I'm one of the founders of Forge Rock, now enjoying my retirement, but still passionate about authorization and, and the problems that we need to solve with that. Um, the the and have been actively involved in in authorization for probably 20 years much like jerry we've all been playing this game for some time fabulous so i think that leaves david as the only one that hasn't said anything yet so david go hey hi everyone my name is david i am the cto at axiomatics i've been with Axiomatic since 2010, um, left for a short stint in the world of consumer identity at Salesforce, and then came back because, much like um, the three of you, I, I really like authorization. I missed it so much, I wanted, to, I wanted to come back. And all in all, I've been involved with authorization for all of my career, I think, for the, for the past 15 years. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so... It's a reasonable group of people to have this conversation with. Um, and as Alan said, you know, we've, we've uh, collectively been playing this, this game, uh, not necessarily just the authorization game, uh, but the identity game generally for 20 years. Um, and authorization is a really big part of that. Um, and I think, you know, one of the conversations we'll get into here over the next 40 to 45 minutes is, you know, what, the state of the union is as far as authorization is concerned and how things need to evolve and why they need to evolve. Before we start that, though, um, I think it's worth just kind of level setting um, for everyone. We don't necessarily know who's listening into this. So if you've been in the industry for the same length of time as we all have and you're perfectly knowledgeable about authorization, that's great. You can tune out for two minutes. Uh, but for those of you who maybe don't have that background or are coming to this from a, a different perspective, probably worth just explaining what we mean when we start talking about authorization. Um, and we, we had a little vote earlier before we started, and we decided that this was going to be David's problem to solve. So, David, would you like to explain to us, please, what authorization is? And then we will all disagree with you. Thank you. <laughs> I'm not too sure. I'm a little confused. <laughs> Um, but joke aside, um, you, you can see authentication as um, proving who you are, right? So you, we want to establish your identity somehow through username, password, or another means you're going to prove who you are, right? Um, but that doesn't really say what it is you can do. That's where authorization kicks in. It's all about determining what you can or cannot do for that matter. So think of it as... When you go to a house, you might have the key to the front door. That's kind of authenticating you with the front door, and you can enter the house. But it doesn't really mean that you can go into the kitchen and raid the fridge or go up to a bedroom or do whatever, right? That's really what authorization is going to focus on in a nutshell. Perfect. Thank you. And I really like that analogy, not least because all the house needs to know actually is that you have a key it doesn't need to know anything else about you it's just connecting you with that which i think is an important subtlety 
Um, and so oh, one of then, the things... Uh, sorry, Andy, but we missed the authentication step there because he's got a bearer token. He has the key to the house, but we don't know who it is. So, <laughs> <laughs> so okay. there is that. So we were today going to talk about authorization. Today, in fact, what we're going to do is we're going to start with identity verification and proofing. And then... <laughs> you'll, you'll probably um, cover those things in, in future I, webinars, I, I guess. Think, I think we might, but it's a very good point nonetheless. These things do go together, and there are times where, you know, uh, actual verification is, is required, times where it's not. Um, but once you get through all of those steps, I think, you know, David describes this pretty well, that authorization is about which rooms can I get into in the house, right? Um, uh, and potentially even more than that, what can I do when I get inside those rooms? Um, and one of the things we we talked about, we actually had a, a panel about this on the main stage at the Identiverse conference last year. Um, we talked a little bit about the fact that authorization um, kind of needs to go through the same development that authentication has has gone through over the last 24 months. Um, when you look at you know, the development of pass keys, the way that that's really starting to optimize the way that people get through that front door. It's both safer and it's more convenient for, you know, regular users of the internet. Um, that that authorization needs to have a similar kind of epiphany. Um, and, and I guess a question that I think about when we talk about what is authorization is, I think for a lot of people, it's still hard to see the immediate impact on the user of these things. And yet, in a lot of the working groups, we have conversations about some really quite complex use cases, things like, you know, parents trying to manage access to bank accounts or health insurance for their children. And there's very complicated intersections with privacy in there as well. Um, and at a certain point, these things have very real impacts on the way that people interact with digital services. Um, and I, to me, at least, and I'm interested in, in the collective view here, but to me, at least, it's some of those things that are really starting to drive this need for us to, to get better ways of solving these problems. Is that a, is that a reasonable assertion? Um, I'll dive on in. Sure, it's a reasonable decision. Um, I, I would what I would end up saying is that because we're moving I, 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 and maybe moving is the wrong word, but because we are putting more and more of the processes we end up dealing with in a digital form or even in a in a self-managed form, right? You go to the, the your bank website, you do your bank processing, et cetera. We have to have explicit controls over what an individual user is able to see and do and manipulate. David's example of the house is a great example, but we don't actually have authorization controls in place to stop you going in to look at the fridge, other than the fact that you will be frowned upon by the rest of humanity for raiding somebody else's fridge. Um, if that fridge was, you know, if it, if it, we take it down to the point where there's money sitting on the counter, um, now we, we get into this problem of, you know, if you've walked into the house, are you able to have that money? Can you take it? And if not, do we have some way of stopping you from taking that money? Um, and as we move more and more things where we're working digitally, we're working online, being able to have that even though, um, you know, Andy, you and I may bank at the same bank, I don't want you to be able to look at my bank accounts and vice versa. So we have to have that access control in order to make the experience work for everybody. You know, I think you've, you've touched on some different personas here too. So we focus on the user experience, you know, the customer, can they see everything they should and not see the things they should not see or do? Um, how does that get implemented? You know, how does the developer of that application actually make this happen easily? And then thirdly, you could look at the verification side of things or audit. You know, can we confirm that the rules we want to have in place are actually functioning as desired as, as we, uh, we expect them to? And, and can we look back 
to if we need to do some kind of investigation. Well, something seems to have gone wrong here. Can we look into the system and the logs and and the policies and what have you, and determine what happened in the past? So there's lots of different personas that are interested in in the outcome here. Yeah, and just to build on what you both said, Alan and Jerry, and also Andy, um, it, it points to the fact that there's different kinds of authorization. Potentially, there's user-driven authorization where I want to grant access to my medical record um, to, say, Jerry, for whatever reason. There is no rule behind that. I just want to do that. Uh, or um, I think, Alan, you mentioned um, the bank account use case where you want to be able to see your, your kids' bank accounts or something along those lines. Uh, so there's different sources, right? User-driven, there's enterprise-driven where the business as a whole is going to decide that these are the authorization rules that you want to enforce. And then there could be discretionary access control as well. Even within the enterprise, I'm working on a Google Doc and I want to share it with the three of you. There's no enterprise rule that says that I um, should Right. It's there, there's no logic to it. I just want to share it with you. There could be, however, an enterprise rule that says I cannot share outside of my company, but that could pile up on top of, of the other rules. Then, Andy, um, you mentioned something, you know, you were asking, why is it that we're seeing more authorization? And to to strengthen Alan's point earlier, because it's, it's going to sound very corny and marketing like, but because everything is so much more digital these days that we expect banking to be digital, we expect healthcare to be digital, we expect everything to be digital, there's more data to be had and stolen and exploited, and therefore there's more need for authorization. Whereas in the past, my medical records, they were protected or protected because they were in a physical office in a physical cabinet with a tiny little key. And the only threat was someone physically walking into that, that doctor's office and stealing the file. That is no longer the case. That's super helpful. So, you know, part of the reason that we wanted to get this particular group of people together for this conversation, apart from your many years of wisdom uh, and sagacity, um, is that my understanding is that coming out of uh, actually of the Identiverse conference last year, uh, a working group kind of got established. Um, which I think is called the Author Zen Working Group. Um, and so it would be interesting to get a little bit of perspective on how that came about and what problems that group is trying to solve um, and, you know, what the current state of play is. Yeah, I think Alan and I were the first instigators of this, not <laughs> last year, but the year before. So um, Alan and I... I lose track know, of years very easily at this point. So. <laughs> that's right. That's right. You know, sometimes these things take a little while to uh, to germinate. But, uh, you know, we had some, some conversations about authorization, and I had been working at Strata on this, you know, new uh, policy format called IDQL, and we're trying to figure out, okay, how does this fit into the, the whole universe of authorization? And we gathered a bunch of people together, I don't know, maybe 15 or so people in a room. And there, and there was you know, some good conversation and uh, a little bit of activity on an email list for a couple of months, but then sort of tailed off. And then we come to last year, Alan, and we, we decide, okay, can we, is this timing better this year, Alan? And we, you know, we invited some different people and uh, it worked out a little bit better this time around. Yeah, um, it was sort of a, a little bit of a false start on the first year, um, and and one of the things just to give a bit sort of a bit of background as to why I was sort of championing the cause and trying to talk to you and some of the other folks and getting that was the observation that. <laughs> maybe it's a contentious thing to say, but I had sort of come to the conclusion that authentication was done. We, we 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 hadn't done all of the things that were necessary to actually get authentication to work properly, but we had a pretty good idea of how to do it, and we had a pretty good idea and agreement amongst the industry on technologies that we can start using. And we've sort of seen this with the adoption of sign-on with Apple and sign-on with Google and pass keys. Um, you started seeing the same let's call it the same it, with with appropriate uh, uh, tip of, tipping of the hat to Ian Glazer to ceremonies, right, that, that people went through with authentication. The challenge that we had was that once you'd authenticated, authorization was the wild, wild west. Everybody had their own way of addressing the problem. Um, and from my perspective, the introduction or the 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 more and more 
sort of the larger and larger adoption of cloud-based services where those access controls needed to be done in the cloud. And it became clear that everybody was doing things in different ways. And that's sort of where you and I started talking and saying, okay, is there some way that we can at least all get together around a table? which we did, and then it flopped, <laughs> and then we did again. And I think the sort of second time, what, what was really interesting to me was the caliber of the people that came around the table. There was actually some solid commitment from many of the major players, major companies involved in this that were willing to get behind it. And so that's sort of where Auth then came into it and, and started going. Excellent. Um, and so, you know, we, we touched on some of this, I think, earlier on, but I guess, what are you hoping to solve ultimately? Because, I mean, this, as you say, it's the Wild <laughs> West, right? There's a lot of space in the Wild West. Right? Um, and so, you know, we've talked a little bit about policies, about policy writing, about people doing things that they want to do, about businesses doing things they want to do. We've You just touched, Alan, on the notion of, of, sure, we have some idea of how to implement these controls within an organizational entity, but sharing those controls in a federated manner across organizational entities. Like, are we trying to solve all of that? Are you trying to solve part of it? Is there a, a prioritization in there? You're trying mm -hmm. to get a sense of the scope. Yeah, I think we're trying to do quite a bit of what you described, Andy. But even if you just take a, a brief step back and look at the how the industry has evolved over the last few years or so, there's so much investment happening right now in authorization. When you look at all the vendors uh, with commercial products, at last count, I think I found at least 14 or something on that order. And then about at least half as many open source projects. So there's an amazing amount of investment going on, innovations, trying to solve this very complex area. But that seemed to further fragment uh, the industry, you know, to Alan's point. So we we're trying to figure out, uh, is there a way to introduce some level of interoperability here to authorization like we have on the authentication side? When you look at the success of SAML and then OAuth and OpenID Connect, you know, there's, there's a sort of a table stakes level of interoperability possible with authentication. And we, we, we're we striving to reach some level of that with authorization. And there's yeah, some stepwise ways we're trying to do that, right, David? Yeah, to build on what you said, Jerry, you know, when you do the count of 14 or 15 different um, products or vendors or solutions out there, I think the count you have, and I probably have the same count, it's also biased with the fact that we're from the IAM community. If we went to industry-specific environments, maybe the healthcare software development side of things, there might be other solutions. And the truth is, they shouldn't be redeveloping authorization. They should be turning to us, much like we've turned to um, OAuth and SAML. I can't believe we're mentioning SAML a second time. Um, um, for, for, for authentication and identity management, they need to turn to AuthZen, and the, the different standards that exist behind for authorization. And the, the realization, we had a really good paper in the ID Pro newsletter a few months ago on the taxonomy of authorization put together by Alex Babineau of Three Edges and Tarek Shaw of um, uh, Capital One. And they were saying, well, you have relationship-based access control. This is what it is. You have graph-based authorization. That's what that is. There's policy-driven authorization with the likes of Alpha, with the likes of Rego and Open Policy Agent and the likes of Cedar. And then you have things like NGAC from this. So, you know, they were mapping out how all these different standards um, or techniques correlate. What we want to do within all Zen is abstract further. And I think we have three main goals, right, Jerry, to summarize what you said. Number one is provide an interop interface. So think of a pet PDP type interface where there's a standard way of asking a question and getting a response back. That's number one. Number two is agreeing on the design patterns and the best practices. So I just said pet PDP. That's a very PDP biased view of the world, a very Zach Mole biased view of the world. But of course, the token people out there, you know, the the OAuth people and the OpenID people might say, well, hang on a minute, I want to do rich authorization requests, or I want to do 
um, access tokens or, or whatever, or claims and scopes, whatever it may be. And then the third thing is really education. Going back to my vertical comment, we need to go out to those vertical vendors and tell them, hey, don't do authorization your own specific way in healthcare. Don't do authorization your own specific way in finance or whatever it may be. Turn to the IAM professionals, if you will, and, and do authorization with the standard framework. I'm, I'm going to jump into this as well because there's an aspect of this that I think is important that, that we sort of look at, and that is nobody actually wants authorization for authorization's sake. It, it, it's not a thing. It's a, it's a means to an end. And so ultimately, at least from an, if we just look at it from the enterprise case, authorization is something that the CISO and the board are required to do to be diligent and protect their access. And so they don't look at things to say, oh, you should only be able to see the customers in your region in Salesforce. That's, you know, to many of the board members are looking at that and saying, oh, that's great. What's Salesforce? Um, or it's a tool that we use, et cetera. Really what the enterprise is doing is sort of saying we have a policy that people in a region should only be able to see the information that pertains to their region. And and the point that we forget in the industry is sort of the, the, the next phrase, and that is no matter what tool they are using. And that's part of the problem for me to try and address is that there's lots of different ways that we access data. And we're trying to enforce some level of policy as it's used in sort of government policy kind of thing, right? There's, there's directives as to what people, how people should behave. And access control is our way of enforcing that. And to me, that's part of the problem that we need to try and address. How do we try and enforce it in Salesforce and in AWS and in Workday and in XYZ app that we've written internally? Um, you know, honestly, and I come back to this, if you think of the bank, I really don't care what tool the teller uses to access my account, they shouldn't be able to take money out of my account without me knowing about it. <laughs> and I don't care how they access it, right? That's really the challenge that we have to try and address. So, Alan, you're, you're saying that you're okay with a teller stealing money from you if they tell you they're doing it? <laughs> well, they do that anyway. <laughs> I want to have the ability to say no. <laughs> I had a I had a quiet bet with myself as to how long it was going to be before anybody said Zachamol, or was it going to be me or David that said it first? So <laughs> you won. <laughs> I, I was going to win anyway, uh, much to the bank teller point. But yes. Um, so okay, we've got a lot of problems to solve we've got a bunch of people getting together trying to solve them. Um, how far along do you think we are? And I realize that's a, that's a horribly vague question, but I'm just trying to get a sense of, you know, th there's a lot of different areas that we've, that we've talked about, and actually some areas that we haven't talked about, like policy writing and policy evaluation and, you know, the role that AI might play in that. And we might get to some of those questions a bit later on. Um, this group of people came together, you know, what, nine months ago, plus or minus. Um, I'm, I'm discounting the false start, evidently, with that. Um, <laughs> so, so, you know, how how far along are we in this grand effort? Mm -hmm. Well, we spent a little bit of time just putting together a charter to submit to the Open ID Foundation. So that took, I don't know, a few months or so after Dead Inverse Con. Uh, conference and then that was approved in October so we're really just getting going but I think a couple of things we I think we have the right people in the room there's probably a few others that we'll still try to draw in over time but by and large I think we have the right people in the room as Alan mentioned earlier and really motivated to make uh, make a lot of progress here and we do also have a fairly aggressive timeline uh, so we want to do be able to do an interoperability demonstration at Identiverse this year, and uh, because of that, 
uh, you know, aggressive timeline, we really narrowed the focus of the first scenario that we want to uh, to interoperate on. And David, maybe you can talk more to those specifics. Yes, absolutely. And, and since Andy, you brought up Zachbull again, we're actually starting from a 2007 or 2008 interop Zachbull document that I think you might have co-written, Jerry. Uh, uh, it's it's possible. Well, there was a couple around that timeline, right? There was one at the Burton Group Catalyst one year, and then there was another one at the RSA conference. The, year the RSA after. conference, yeah. Yeah, so it's right around yeah. right around that timeline. Yeah. So in um, starting from those scenarios, I mean, they're very straightforward. When when you think about authorization, there's really two ways to ask a question. Either you ask for a yes no question, so can Alice view Alan's bank account? Or you could also say, oh, tell me which bank accounts um, Alice can do. And there's there's minor variations of those two questions, but these are the two fundamental questions that you can ask, a yes-no question or an open-ended question. And um, if you look at the, the vendor landscape, um, the, the yes-no question is more or less standardized. So, of course, there's this actual way of doing it. But if you look at the Rego way, or the, I should say the open policy agent way, or if you look at, say, Cerbos, who are not standards-based, if you look at Cedar, if you look at many other products, they're 90 to 95% the same, roughly. So it's a matter of getting to 100 with that very first interop we're going to do at Identiverse at the end of May. And then later we can tackle the bigger question, which is, well, how do we do open-ended? How do we do filtering? Which is you know, a kind of open-ended question. And is there any value in standardizing that? Because different vendors have radically different ways of doing it and, and different approaches. Uh, and I said vendors or framework, right? Um, you know, uh, if you take an open FGA as an example, they control all the data so they can do some kind of filtering. If you look at, say, a Zachmold based approach like Axiomatics, they do not control all the data by design. It's a choice in both frameworks. So that changes the way um, filtering uh, works. So that's, you know, the, the very first step is getting everyone to agree to that, but also, you know, extending into the patterns, because I think the the biggest challenge isn't really so much standardizing the PET PDP interface. Yes, it's going to be amazing to do that. It's going to be amazing to see, you know, people coalesce around that standard. But I think the biggest challenge is what Alan pointed to, which is the enforcement piece and getting a Salesforce, getting a Workday, getting a you name it to actually implement an architecture that lets you plug in a PEP. And that's why sometimes we, we within Auth Zen, we talk about the OAuth moment. We want to get to the OAuth moment where now when you buy a product, a SaaS or, or a COTS, um, you obviously look at whether that SaaS supports OAuth or OpenID Connect or even SAML, because there is no way you would ever recreate users and passwords within that product. You expect to connect to your own IDP. We want people to have that same expectation with authorization. There's no way you should have to reconfigure authorization in each and every system that you own because that creates authorization silos and that leads to other issues. You, we should build the expectation and in, in, in buyers that they can tell the vendors that they need to be compliant with AuthZen. That's what really what we're aiming for. Yeah, yeah let's, I, I let's, would go ahead. I'll, I was going to say, I would second that from the perspective that they're, they're re this is really not a easy, well-defined, how close are we to being done on this journey, right? There, there are lots of things that we standardize on. Some things we're actually well advanced on as an industry, things like OAuth. Right. Um, I, I noticed David managed to get Zachmel into his little piece three times, so he's, he's winning on that one. But, you know, when we have specs like OAuth and, and things like that, um, that's helping us to get towards sort of the end goal. So there's lots and lots of things we can do. And I think answering sort of your question, the very first thing that we ended up talking about actually at the meeting that we had at Identiverse last year was what is the low hanging fruit, right? What are the things that we can work towards agreement and coming up with, because it really is a, 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 you know, if you take the entirety of the problem, we'll just throw our hands up and walk away. So, you know, we, we're looking at low hanging fruit, things that we can standardize on and build it up. And slowly but surely, we're going to build our way up the, the, the problem until we start looking at some of those bigger ones. Sorry, Andy, you can. <laughs> no, I, it's, it's always that challenge in these conversations, but yes, we all agree with each other. <laughs> um, 
I, it, it's also funny. So we've mentioned, I think, almost all of the uh, the relevant acronyms. Um, I, another parallel that I might draw in terms of the the, the federated adoption problem um, is, as you're describing it, I'm reminded a lot of SKIM um, from a provisioning standpoint and the amount of time that it took for particularly the SaaS vendors to, to say, not all of them, there are exceptions, but for a lot of them to say, oh yeah, okay, there's a reason why we need to we need to start supporting this. And it was architecturally difficult because it, you know, typically drove changes on their end. And I suspect this is going to be much the same. Um, and it, although I think the push from enterprise will be very helpful. The push from regulators, not direct, the indirect push from regulators will be very helpful. I also wonder whether there's a case to be made here that says, yeah, if you're a you know, cloud-based provider of solutions, whether that's a commercial enterprise or whether it just happens to be, you know, you're, you're servicing a supply chain or whatever it might be, that actually, yeah, there's a, there's a an effort involved in making whatever changes are required. But here's, you know, what that looks like. Here's how we can plug this in in most cases. And here are the benefits that you get off the back by not having to maintain, you know, your proprietary infrastructure over time. Um, I, I don't. I mean, I'm hypothesizing entirely, but it feels to me as though there might be an interesting conversation to to be had in that area. Um, and particularly if you've got members of the group that that represent those sorts of of organizations. I, I think, yes, that that's going to happen. Some organizations are going to dig their heels in and will be pulled along kicking and screaming. Other ones will be leading the charge. Um, and I think that if we if we can get it right, it's actually going to be led by the consumers of our technology, right? Um, when you come up to a point, and, and this was one of the comments, again, made at the, the meeting we had at Identiverse, was that for, for a large enterprise, they basically have to have a new job position in their organization for every cloud app that they onboard because the access control for Salesforce is different than the access control for AWS, which is different, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so when the enterprise comes up and says, I don't need 120 access control specialists, I need this to be simplified, what's going to end up happening is that as a core group of those apps end up working together, <laughs> um, then there's a market benefit for the enterprises to sort of start choosing and adapting that. We saw it happen slowly and painfully, but we saw it happen with SAML. We saw it happen with OpenID Connect. We've seen it happen with uh, passkeys, right? Once, once you get that the the benefit of actually being able to 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 scale it out, then the adoption is almost necessary in order to do business. Yeah. Okay. And there's benefits. Um, I'm sorry, Andy. There there's okay. benefits for those companies and for those um, product vendors, those SaaS vendors to actually adapt. I've, I've seen a few SaaS where the data model is so complex, the authorization model is consequently very complex, and it, it takes users of those SaaS days to align the authorization correctly. And of course, if those consumers as enterprises change how they do business, then the reconfiguring of those SaaS is, is also extremely time consuming and error prone. Once you externalize through OffZen to a solution, uh, policy driven or whatever format it may be, that's going to simplify the equation. And that's the driver for adoption of OffZen. It's not necessarily just about the security, it's about the convenience, the ease, uh, making developers' lives easier, making the compliance folks happy too, right? It's it's a win-win. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's interesting. I, I think, you know, going back to the parallel that, that we all drew um, with, you know, passkeys and, and, and the authentication sort of end of this, that marriage that I think all of us have talked about at great length um, and, and many others besides over the years of, of security and convenience, right, seems to be a, a, a really important trend. Um, and, and that applies in this case as, as much as in those. Um, 
So I'd, I'd love to just think a little bit um, about where this is going over the course of the next few years, not so much in the sense of which problems do we solve next. I think we've talked about that quite a bit, although if there are any that we haven't touched on, uh, you should chime in. But it occurs to me that we're at a point in the industry where an awful lot of things are changing very, very rapidly. I mentioned AI and machine learning earlier on. That's clearly a thing that's affecting, you know, everybody. Um, but we also have a lot going on in terms of the way that credentials are being stored and presented and verified by others. Um, and here I'm thinking in particular of digital wallets, of how that's impacting not only citizen identity, but also, um, you know, workforce identity in some cases. And I think my sense is, feel free to disagree, that that's a trend that's likely to continue. Um, I think we're also seeing a lot more continuous evaluation of data during the course of a transaction. Um, and so I wonder, you know, in that sort of shifting landscape of technology, of standards, of architecture, does any of that impact this work in particular? And if so, how? Yeah, I think um, you yeah, a few things there, Andy. It's not a zero sum game here. I think those technologies you described ought to be able to work together with what Auth Zen is doing. And there's there's definitely some you know uh, points of interaction where if you think about digital wallets and verified credentials that might be contained therein, why couldn't that that data item or items be part of a access decision? Right? That seems logical to me. It's not just for the authentication ceremony, but certainly can be incorporated into an access control decision. So uh, I, I don't think there's a, a great leap of faith or technology to make something like that happen. But I think at, at the moment it would be more product specific rather than what we're doing. Uh, but the continuous, continuous access uh, approach, I think that's part and parcel of what authorization systems do today anyway, but there's some different formats, right? There's shared signals. You know, and how does a publisher of a signal get that data to a receiver, a subscriber, so that it can act on it? And so there's there's quite a few additional moving parts involved with continuous access. But I think uh, I believe there's at least one or two folks within Auth Zen that are also in the shared sig signals uh, working group. So there there is overlap there. So there is a conscience conscious view of, you know, uh, I think how these things should inter interact in the future. So that I believe that's within scope and within reason to uh, to accomplish some, uh, you know, some degree of interoperability or that these parts are uh, parts of a puzzle actually fit together. You know, it's not, you know, it's some disjointed kind of uh, different technologies that don't work together, but I think they can all be of the same, the same picture. I, I I would agree, and I think that you know we we go back to the old saying, right? The only thing constant is change, and the the sort of second piece that I look at every single working group and every single standard that we've worked on, some of them have worked, and some of them have been I don't want to call them failures, but but some of them have been less successful. We don't always get something right and we learn from it and we go back and do either do something else or fix on it. Um, you know, AI is a really interesting problem because I think one of the aspects of access control that we haven't spent much time on as an industry is the issue of provability, right? Can I prove that this is going to come up with the decision that is consistent with my policy um, and and I don't know how that plays in. There's an awful lot of new technologies that come into that scope. But where I think it is important is, does it get us closer to the end zone, using a Super Bowl anal analogy here, but does it get us closer to the end zone of making it easier to 
state the policy and then enforce a policy across an enterprise? Does it make it easier for the users to be able to protect and access the information that they're allowed to and not to access the other information? We can throw lots and lots of technologies at it, some of which will work and some of which won't. I really loved digital certificates but we kind of messed up that in the implementation a little bit. So, you know, th this happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. To add to your points, Alan and, and Jerry and Andy. Um, so on AI, I, yeah, AI will play a part. Like denying that would be, I think, deaf to, uh, to AI. Um, you know, shameless plug as a vendor, we actually are working on AI. We did announce a product um, last year. We will be GAing it at Identiverse this year. So we're pretty excited about what AI can do, uh, mainly in terms of policy requirements gathering. Uh, one of the challenges that we've seen with customers is that it's hard, especially when you've been so R back and group biased, it's hard to think in plain old English and in, in, in a way that's going to help you write policy. So AI is going to help with that for sure. Uh, but the other part, I think, Jared, that you were mentioning uh, about continuous evaluation, definitely the ABAC model as defined by NIST, as defined in ZACWL, is about continuous access. But then it goes back to the question of how do you do the enforcement and where do you consistently do the enforcement, which goes back to your point, Alan, making sure that you know, no matter the system you have, having the assurance that you've enforced the exact same authorization configuration policy, whatever it may be, across your Salesforce and your homegrown apps and your whatever else is. So yeah, lots of room for improvement there. And yeah. Andy, one yeah, last it, one, actually, I just remember. Consumer identity, you mentioned citizen identity. I think that the fact that we now have good citizen identities is going to increase the need for authorization because there will be new scenarios to protect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and what's interesting when you talk about AI being helpful in in you know sort of policy writing as well, and my mm -hmm. my mind immediately goes to you know, most of what we've talked about today has been the enterprise writing policy that will mm -hmm. apply to you know, the workforce or to its customers, um, and, and then there's the next step, which is you know as a citizen, as a customer, I may want to be able to write my own policy that applies to things, right? And and I, I mean I think it's fair to say that we're not there yet. We probably need to get there, and I do wonder whether you know some of those AI tools are going to be incredibly, potentially incredibly helpful in in those sorts of scenarios. One of the things that jumps to mind as you talk about that, right, is that writing policy. There's an entire Reddit subculture on malicious compliance, which is basically an entire subculture around getting policy wrong because we we don't know how to express actually what that policy is and so you know when you say we're not there yet absolutely <laughs> you know malicious compliance is 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 <laughs> what we end up doing every day yeah yeah um so i'm conscious that we're kind of coming up towards time um often a question i ask around about now is okay if you're a uh you know, a, a professional in this industry, a, a digital identity practitioner, you know, what are the steps you should take to prepare for this new thing? And I think we're probably a little bit ahead of the game with that particular question. But um, it sounds like we've got the potential for an interop uh, at Identiverse, which probably means that we'll have, you know, some some information. And I'm guessing that there's still a desire to get more people involved in helping with use cases, with scoping, with figuring out solutions, with those sorts of things. Is that is that a fair statement? And if that's true, what's the best way for people to start to get involved in, in this work? Let me jump in on, on that first one and say, mm -hmm. yes, absolutely. Getting more people involved is really, really important. And the kinds of people that we want to get involved are not necessarily those of us who are busy implementing auth authorization solutions, but the the users of that, the, the 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 people that we're writing it for. Because one of the very interesting moments for me in the meetings that we've had is someone like Hutch who's working at a bank and saying, these are the problems I'm having and I would like a solution for them. And so having people engage with Orthen and to sort of say, these are the kinds of things that are causing us pain keeps the implementation focused on addressing that pain rather than what 
geeks love to do, and that's argue about whether it should be a parenthesis or a brace, you know. Um. <laughs> so I, I made a note earlier on, uh, as David said, oh, we're going to do an interop at Identiverse this year. And I'm like, oh, yes, better make sure we make space for that. I'm now thinking I want to put a big cork board up somewhere that says, put your authorization use case here and have people come and just pin it up so that uh, we can collect. That would it. be fabulous. We'd love that. Uh, excellent. Yes. I hope, hope somebody took notes. Hopefully uh, we'll, we'll see if we can do that. Um, so listen, I, I really want to thank uh, all three of you, um, David, Alan, Jerry, for, for joining us today. Um, I think that's been a, a really valuable kind of overview of, of progress in this particular area. Um, I'm really excited to see what comes out of this. Um, I'm very excited to see the Introp at Identiverse. Uh, for those watching this who don't know, that takes place May 28th to the 31st this year. Um, and I hope that we'll see lots of you there. And if we don't, hopefully we'll see you at the next one of these. Um, any closing comments from any of the three of you? No, we've no, got a lot, we, well, we, just one closing comment. Yeah, we've got a lot of work to do uh, in order to make that interop happen in Vegas, but we're we're diligently doing that every week with our with our calls, and you can track our progress, you know, by joining the mailing list mailing list over at OpenID Foundation. So, uh, as Alan said, yeah, always looking forward to hearing more insights and more use cases. Fantastic. Well, thank you again very much indeed. Uh, and uh, like I say, look forward to seeing everyone on the next one and at Identiverse in May. Thank you very much. See you in Thanks, everyone. Bye now. Thank you. See you in May. See you in May. loved meeting new people and just getting the different experiences and especially having uh, this conference focus not just on the technical aspects but more on the business side of how we bring identity in and make it real for uh, our consumers.